The Other Gods by Howard Philip Lovecraft Atop the tallest of Earth's peaks dwell the gods of Earth, and suffer no man to tell that he hath looked upon them. Lesser peaks they once inhabited, but ever the men from the plains would scale the slopes of rock and snow, driving the gods to higher and higher mountains, till now only the last remains. When they left their older peaks, they took with them all signs of themselves, save once, it is said, when they left a carven image on the face of the mountain which they called Ngranek. But now they have betaken themselves to unknown Kedah, in the cold waste where no man treads, and are grown stern, having no higher peak whereto to flee at the coming of men. They are grown stern, and where once they suffered men to displace them, they now forbid men to come, or coming to depart. It is well for men that they seek no knot of Gadath in the cold waste, else they would seek injudiciously to scale it. Sometimes, when earth's gods are homesick, they visit in the still n night the peaks where once they dwelt, and weep softly as they try to play in the olden way on remembered slopes. Men have felt the tears of the gods in the white-capped Therai, though they have thought it rain, and have heard the sighs of the gods in the plaintive dawn winds of Larion. In cloud ships the gods are wont to travel, and wise cotters have legends that keep them from certain high peaks at night when it is cloudy, for the gods are not lenient as of old. In Uthar, which lies beyond the river sky, once dwelt an old man, avid to behold the gods of earth, a man deeply learned in the seven cryptical books of Hassan, the fami and familiar with the Pnopic manuscripts of distant and frozen Lomar. His name was Barzai, Barzai the Wise, and the villagers tell of how he went up a mountain on the, on the night of the strange eclipse. Barzai, knew so much of the gods that he could tell their comings and goings, and guessed so many of their secrets that he was deemed half a god himself. It was he who wisely advised the burgesses of Othar that they passed their remarkable law against the slaying of cats, and who first told the young priest to tell where it is that black cats go at midnight on St. John's Eve. Barzai was learned in the lore of Earth's gods, and had gained and had gained a desire to look upon their faces. He believed that his great secret knowledge of gods could shield him from their wrath, so resolved to go up to the summit of high and rocky Cathay Kla on a night where he knew the gods would be there. Cathay Kla is far in the stony desert beyond Hatheg, for which it is named, and rises like a rock statue in a silent temple. Around its peak the mists play always mournfully, for mists are the memories of the gods, and the gods loved Hathek Kla when they dwelt upon it in the old days. Often the gods of earth visit Hathek Kla in their ships of cloud, casting pale vapours over the slopes as they dance reminiscently on the summit under a clear moon. The villagers of Hathek say that it is ill to climb Hathek Kla at any time, and deadly to climb it by night when pale vapours hide the summit in the moon. But Barzai heeded them not when he came from neighbouring Ulthar with the young priest to tell, who was his disciple. Atel was only the son of an innkeeper, and was sometimes afraid, but Barzai's father had been a landgrave who dwelt in an ancient castle, so he had no common superstition in his blood, and only laughed at the fearful cotters. Barzai and Atel went out of Hathak into the stony desert despite the prayers of peasants and talked of earth's gods by the campfires at night. Many days they travelled and from afar saw lofty Hathak Kla with his aureole of mournful mist. On the thirteenth day they reached the mountain's lonely base and Atel spoke of his fears, but Barzai was old and learned and had no fears, so led the way boldly up the slope that no man had scaled since, his, since the time of Sansu, who was written of with fright in the mouldy Canopic manu manuscripts. The narcotic manuscripts. Hmm. 
the way was rocky and made perilous by chasms, cliffs, and falling stones. Later it grew cold and snowy, and bars I and Atel often slipped and fell as they hewed and plodded upward with staves and axes. Finally the air grew thin and the sky changed colour, and the climbers found it hard to breathe, but still they toiled up and up, marvelling at the strangeness of the scene, and thrilling at the thought of what would happen on the summit when the moon was out and the pale vapours spread around. For three days they climbed higher, higher, and higher, toward the roof of the world, when they came to wait for the clouding of the moon. For four nights no clouds came, and the moon shone down cold through the thin mournful mists around the silent pinnacle. Then on the fifth night, which was the night of the full moon, Barzai saw some dense clouds far, far to the north, and stayed up with a tail to watch them draw near. Thick and majestic they sailed, slowly and deliberately onward, ranging themselves round the peak, high above the watches, and hiding the moon and the summit from view. For a long hour the watchers gazed, as the vapours swirled and the screen of clouds grew thicker and more restless. Barzai was wise in the lore of Earth's gods, and listened hard for certain sounds, but Atel felt the chill of the vapours and the awe of the night, and feared much. And when Barzai began to climb higher and beckon eagerly, it was long before Atel would follow. So thick were the vapours, that the way was hard, and though Atel followed on at last, he could scarce see the grey shape of Barzai and the dim slope above in the clouded moonlight. Barzai forged very far ahead, and seemed despite his age to climb more easily than Atel, fearing not the steepness that began to grow too great for any save a strong and dauntless man, nor pausing at wide black chasms that Atel scarce could leap. And so they went up wildly over rocks and gulfs, slipping and stumbling, and sometimes awed at the vastness and horrible silence of bleak ice pinnacles and mute granite steeps. Very suddenly Barzai went out of Atel's sight, scaling a hideous cliff that seemed to bulge outward and block the path for any climber not inspired of Earth's gods. Atel was far below and planning what he should do when he reached the place, where curiously he noticed that the light had grown strong, as if the cloudless peak and moonlit meeting base of the When curiously he noticed that the light had grown strong, as if the cloudless peak and moonlit meeting place of the gods were very near. And as he scrambled on towards the bulging cliff and the litten sky, he felt fears more shocking than any he had known before. Then through the high mists he heard the voice of unseen Barzai shouting wildly in delight. I have heard the gods, I have heard Earth's gods singing in revelry on Hathe Kla. The voice of Earth's gods are known to Barzai the prophet. The mists are thin, and the moon is bright, and I shall see the gods dancing wildly on Hathe Kla that they, love in, that they loved in youth. The wisdom of Bazai hath made him greater than Earth's gods, and against his will their spells and barriers are as naught. Bazai will behold the gods, the proud gods, the secret gods, the gods of Earth who spurn the sight of men. Atel could not hear the voices Bazai heard, but he was now close to the bulging cliff and scanning it for footholds. Then he heard Barzai's voice grow shriller and louder. The mists are very thin, and the moon casts shadows on the slope. The voices of the earth gods are high and wild, and they fear the coming of Barzai the wise, who is greater than they. The moon's light flickers as earth gods dance against it. I shall see the dancing forms of the gods that leap and howl in the moonlight. The light is dimmer, and the gods are afraid. Whilst Barzai was shouting these things, Atel felt a spectral change in the air, as if the laws of earth were bowing to greater laws. For though the way was steeper than ever, the upward path was now growing fearsomely easy, and the bulging cliff proved scarce an obstacle when he reached it and slid perilously up its convex face. The light of the moon had strangely failed, and as Atel plunged upward through the mist, he heard Barzai the wire shrieking in the shadows. The moon is dark! The gods dance in the night, there is terror in the sky, for upon the moon hath sunk an eclipse foretold in no books of men or of earth's gods. There is unknown magic on Hathe Kla, for the screams of the frightened gods have turned to laughter, and the slopes of ice shoot up endlessly into the black heavens where, whither I am plunging. Hey, hey, at last, in the dim light I behold the gods of earth. And now, Atel, 
slipping dizzily up over inconceivable steeps, heard in the dark a lonesome laughing, mixed with such a cry as no man else ever heard, save in the... Okay, let's try this paragraph again. And now a tell, slipping dizzily up over inconceivable steeps, heard in the dark a loathsome laughing, mixed with such a cry as no man else ever heard, save in the phlegathon of unrelated nightmares. A cry wherein reverberated the horror and anguish of a haunted lifetime, packed into one atrocious moment. The other gods, the other gods, the gods of the outer hells that guard the feeble gods of earth, look away, go back, do not see, do not see, the vengeance of the infinite abysses that curse that damnable pit, merciful gods of earth, I'm falling into the sky. And as Atel shut his eyes, and stopped his ears, and tried to jump downward against the frightful pool from unknown heights, there resounded on Hathekla the terrible peal of thunder, which awaked the good carters of the plains and the honest burgesses of Hatheg and Nir and Uthar, and caused them to behold through the clouds the strange eclipses of the moon that no book ever predicted. And when the moon came out at last, Atel was safe in the lower snows of the mountain without sight of earth's gods or of the other gods. Now it is told in the mouldy, panarchotic manuscripts that Sansu found naught but wordless ice and rock when he climbed Hatheg Kla in the youth of the world. Yet when the men of Ulthor and Neor and Hatheg crushed their fears and scaled their haunted steep by day in search of bars either wise, they found graven in the naked stone of the summits a curious and cyclopean symbol fifty cubits wide, as if the rock had been riven by some titanic chisel and the symbol was like to one that learned men have discerned in those frightful parts of the Pentecotic manuscripts which are too ancient to be read. This they found. Barzai the wise was never found. Nor could the holy priest to tell ever be persuaded to pray for his soul's repose. Moreover, to this day the people, the people of Ulthar and Nir and Hathek fear eclipses, and pray by night when pale vapours hide the mountain top and the moon, and above the myths, myths on how they clear earth's god sometimes dance reminiscently, for they know they are safe, and love to come from unknown Kadath, in the ships of cloud, and play in the olden way as they did when earth was new and men not given to climbing of inaccessible places.'